to take you back to 1995, um, first of all. Um, just to give you an idea of when 1995 was. <laughs> Prior to the start of the HBA, um, Fred West was cremated at Camley Court, uh, at, at um, Camley and Stanford. <coughs> And uh, just after the, the project started, the Spice Girls released their first <laughs> single. So that just gives you a bit of some setting. But prior to working on the HBA, I worked up in, in Ayrshire, and I carried out um, a large-scale phase one mapping exercise in Air and Carrick. And at the start of the project, we were presented with a series of um, five by five kilometre squares of maps at a one to ten kilometre scale. And these, if you're familiar with these, you know, they're big maps. Um, and previous surveys, once we colour coded everything by hand, they were duly put into a map cabinet far too valuable to use in any way, uh, in case they got damaged or lost. So when I was presented with these maps, the first thing I did was go a pair of scissors and I cut them all up into two by three kilometre, uh, kilometre squares and stuck them on my A3 <coughs> sheets and photocopied them. And they then became the basis of the survey. And when we completed the survey two years later, all the maps were colour photocopied twice and the originals were archived. And suddenly you get this idea that this is now a usable commodity. And so when I got word, I, I, um, when I found out about the HPA, I was really interested because I had, had some minor experiences with the power of GIS. But it was that idea that you could actually use that information beyond just doing the survey and then putting in the map cam. So when I applied to the place, and they'd kindly given me an afternoon slot. So I drove the 320 miles down from Moffin in Ayrshire to Warwick to attend the interview, had the interview, um, and then drove back. And I decided I'd stop at Hayden's Wall and take a short walk. And whilst there, I decided to phone home, uh, said I was coming on my way back, and uh, I was told that I'd been off the job. And it was a mix of yes and oh my god. <laughs> <coughs> so I drove back home contacted some uh, estate agents, drove back to Coventry, viewed some properties, signed leases, drove back to Moffin. And once the paperwork for, for the lease of the properties was, was sorted, I then hired a living van, packed all our stuff, drove back to Coventry, and loaded all the stuff in the van into the house in the middle of the living room, just a big pile of stuff. Drove back to Ayrshire, dropped off the van. In fact, I slept in the cab of the van because I arrived so late that I didn't want to disturb anybody in the house. Took the van back, got into the car, loaded my young son with the guinea pig hutch on his lap, <laughs> all our possessions, remaining possessions in the boot, drove back to Coventry. And uh, started work the following day. <laughs> now, amazing what you can do when you're 31. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't end there. But three weeks later, exactly three weeks later, uh, we, gave, I gave, uh, we had a daughter who is obviously now 20. And these are some of her photographs. She's uh, doing zoology degree at Aberdeen. 
and uh, my other two sons uh, followed my mathematical interests, and they're both very mathematical. My eldest is an engineer. So, and hopefully, an engineer has some appreciation for me. <laughs> Now, the people that were instrumental in setting up the actual was Neil Wire, who was the conservation manager of the Wildlife Trust at the time, who left a month after I started to become the chief executive of the Birmingham Black Country Wildlife Trust. And Val Cooper, who was, uh, he worked for what was then called English Nature, that organisation. <coughs> And they managed to convince all the local authorities in the area, the English Nature and the Environment Agency, to fund this project. And they gathered together enough money for a £200,000 budget for the year, two years, initially two years. <coughs> Neil Wyatt and Caroline Lidget, who was the county ecologist at the time, carried out a feasibility study, and part of that feasibility study was to go out to two separate areas and do some survey work within the county and just see what the process was, <coughs> what sort of time it would take, you know, that sort of thing, so that they could then multiply that up and give an idea as to how long the project would take. They actually produced about half a kilometre of data between them, thus proving that the project was on the But they'd already got the money. <laughs> so it went ahead anyway. Now being ahead of the curve is generally considered to be a good thing. But being so far ahead of the curve with this sort of project, you kind of end up disappearing over the horizon. So nobody really knew what, what to expect. And in the words of uh, Stuart Lee, the comedian, if you're going to do a project, about like two years ahead of the curve is better. 20 years is just too much. And we're still there. We're still well ahead of the curve in compared to other counties. And it's really, it's one of the things that I'm really most disappointed about is the fact that other areas haven't followed our lead, both in terms of the way that the project was set up and actually appreciating, appreciating what, the, what can be delivered, because actually what is delivered is far beyond anybody's expectations. <coughs> so when I started, initially, you know, it was quite a nice time. We had Brandon Marsh going around the reserve, meeting people and stuff like that. But ultimately, the work had to start, and we were based down Butts, which is where the, uh, <coughs> the county ecologists and archaeologists were based. <coughs> and we were in, a, in, a, in an annex, flat, flat roof annex. And uh, to describe that building and where we were going to be placed, I'll just tell you. So you go through the door and you're in a little um, uh, a little storage room and they used to put display material. Mm -hmm. and in fact there was a, a wardrobe. If you open the door there was a full life size human skeleton in there. And basically it was a, a visual pun on having a skeleton in the cupboard. Mm -hmm. You then went into the next room, which ultimately became our office. It was the invertebrate <coughs> store and it had these hugely heavy wooden cabinets with all these drawers for the invertebrates. And they were so heavy and been there such a long time, it actually sunk into the concrete floor. <coughs> and then went into the um, stuffed, stuffed mammal collection, which didn't have any windows. <coughs> and then went into a kitchen area, which also had the emergency exit. So you actually had to run, if there was a fire, you had to run through a room with no lighting. If the power had gone out, you'd just end up colliding with all these dead animals. 
Beyond that was the herbarium, which also didn't have a window. And my designated office was at the end. And it had a tiny window that looked out over a brick wall. <laughs> it was like going into a cave. So, um, and, you know, this is, this is where you're going to be working. And I was presented with a computer. Now, we all know what a computer looks like now. <laughs> so Pam Thompson Cox, and quite proudly, <coughs> went, look. And it was a computer that's, the, the base was the size of, you know, those old hi-fi systems. They used to have the eight-track player and the turntable. It was about that size. And it had a, a screen about this big, permanently fixed in the middle of it, which glued green when it was switched off. And I thought she was showing an exhibit. <laughs> <coughs> but she wasn't. <coughs> so my first duty, duty as a project officer was actually to sort out the accommodation of our, our computers. And it's quite interesting that um, the, the kind of difference or the different attitude, and I dare say it still applies today, but on the ecology side of things, Everything was make do. You know, you just made, you know, if you needed something, you constructed that, a bit of twine and some, some bamboo cane. Um, and on the IT side, you know, it was all kind of fantastically impressive. Huge amounts of money devoted to the actual process of capturing the data that the ecological surveyors did. Um, and it was quite interesting. But once we moved into the room, and I painted the floors and actually got some carpet because the benches were quite high up because they'd been used as part of museum services. Um, and I don't know why they like them, but they do like them quite high. Um, and they were on kind of elevated seating with wheels. And on the con concrete floor as we're typing away, you actually find yourself <laughs> rolling around. So you have to put the carpet down so the people actually sit at the uh, at the workstation. Um, but being a storage area, we actually although the, the invertebrate cabinets have been moved, we were left with a huge head of a Hereford longhorn steer, which was attached to the wall above the computer where the GIS people were. And little bits of sawdust would cascade out of the nose of this animal every time the door was open and shut. <laughs> and we never managed to get rid of it. We were also given a uh, dot matrix printer. So we probably remember dot matrix printer. <clears throat> and this dot matrix printer was so loud, you actually had to kind of think before making a phone call. If somebody phoned you, the printer was on. You actually couldn't hear who it was on the other line. And we tried to get, you know, we need a printer. You know, this is a high tech project that we're running. But there's nothing wrong with that printer, it works. I said, we, we actually ended up having to set up a, a, um, a petty cash system. <laughs> we went into 269 pounds of board, a jet, uh, an inkjet printer with that. And in 1995, there was no um, Millennium Mapping or Google Earth or where's the prop part. Um, but we did recognise that value of using aerial photographs and planning and checking the uh, progress of the survey is actually vitally important that you know how much time you're going to devote to one area when you actually. So if you could identify areas of, of where you suspected areas of, of, uh, of high nature conservation value were, that helped immensely and actually, you know, 
um, planning that process. And if we weren't able to gain access to that land, then at least we had some sort of fallback stage where we'd say, well, we checked on the area photographs. <coughs> Coventry had their own, so we, we needed to look at the area photographs of Coventry. Coventry. Solid Hall had their own, we spent some time on Solid Hall during the winter period. But in Warwickshire, we had a complete set of aerial photographs for Warwickshire. <coughs> and we were able to book them out and take them back to the office. We had stereo steps to actually look at the, the, the prints. And just after we finished going through all of the Warwickshire area, and this is over a period of about four years, the cleaner of the county council took a box of aerial photographs that was next to Tony Holmes's desk. So it was just by sheer chance that we were actually able to complete the server before they were all thrown away. In fact, somebody from the county council um, said, Oh, said to Tony, Oh, I didn't know you were throwing away these aerial photographs. <laughs> and he said, You're not. He said, Well, I've just picked these out. The initial survey actually took four years to complete. And I think I need to mention a couple of people who we actually, who were volunteers, we actually employed for a season um, to assist in that. And one of these was Steve Garnett, who's now working up in the Lake District with Warden with the RSPB, desperately trying to save. Um, Hen Harriers from English Hen Harriers from going extinct, and Sven Rufus, who I comically referred to as a, a Scandinavian Rastafarian as a result of his name, um, who was actually living in Glasgow at the time. There's been a lot of travelling associated with this project, uh, and came down. He, he then went down to Brighton and became a Green Party councillor. But it was this. As Steve, as Steve said, this partnership that is really the core of, of the, the project's success. And after the initial two years, it was a little bit awkward because there was an expectation that people would have to contribute additional amounts to, to complete the survey. And we completed Coventry because they were the largest contributor. Um, and I think we've done quite a lot of sol solid holes as well. But in the other districts, we've done bits. And so it was kind of like tied and you suddenly had this tension that people thought, you know, they've got theirs. What if they then say, oh, we're not going to pay any more? The commentary gives them their dues, they actually cough up the cash. And, uh, and in addition to that, we then started talking about <laughs> Wildlife Sites Project, which is a natural extension to the work that we were doing, because we weren't able to devote the sort of time that we needed to some of these sites in order to fully represent uh, the wildlife value that they held. But uh, if I remember rightly, the Environment Agency decided that they weren't going to continue funding. And uh, I don't think English Major did. Um, and the county council, who provided the accommodation, uh, the GIS um, uh, computer equipment, and the access to the landline data on which the, the survey was based, they also thought they wouldn't be able to contribute as much as they had previously. But the other other districts and boroughs continued to fund it, so it went on. And uh, it did mean that there was no chance of me getting any, anything of a main price. And Wildlife Trust is not a great payer. Um, they justified their, uh, their poor wages on a, on a 35 hour week, as opposed to a 37 and a half, which the county council started. To work. And I typically did 45 hours a week <laughs> in order to ensure that we 
completed the survey. <coughs> so I started doing some work with the trust consultancy environmental, uh, Little Marsh Environmental, that would seem fine. And then they started charging me for uh, an administration fee, which seemed to match the national insurance contribution that the employers have to pay. I'm not sure what the legality of that is. And as we uh, went on, and having completed the, the, the um, 2,500 kilometres, kilometres squared of Warwickshire, and produced approximately 13,000 detailed descriptions of the habitats, which included approximately a quarter of a million species records. Um, we kind of, kind of felt that it wasn't really going anywhere. And this is what I'm saying about being ahead of the curve. Because we kind of completed it, nobody really had any ideas Going and I thought that it would be a, a useful thing to do some research. Um, and I spoke to Tom Hughes. And I took my ideas to Andy Tasker with the hope that we could arrange a day release so that I could actually do some, do some research using the HBO data. But he wasn't convinced. Despite the fact that I had. Uh, stated how much overtime I've done. Uh, he suggested that I'd rather squander my bargaining chip by completing the job first. Anyway, so I was quite crushed by that. Um, and shortly after, well, I'm not sure, about a year after, once we completed all the work, I decided to hand in my resignation. But I don't have any regrets. Obviously, it's a fantastic piece of work. And it's really encouraging that it continues to this day. It's really my baby. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a fantastic thing. If you've not been involved in large scale surveys, especially when you actually start putting the information on the GIS, suddenly you start making these connections. Just doing individual surveys just doesn't give me that perspective. And we started talking in terms of landscape scale ecology. And that is the perspective difference that you suddenly get from not having you know, maps in a, a map cabinet, but having something that's really, if you understand what you look at, really kind of speaks to you and comes alive. So it's heartwarming that, uh, that you thought it appropriate to celebrate 20 years of the HBA. And I thank you all very much for coming out. Thank you.